This contemplation is a follow-up to a previous one named Christianity. In that one, I addressed how the essence, or outline, of Christianity is not in alignment with the Old Testament, nor should it be attached or linked to it, as it inverts its own spirit. I know and understand that this statement borders blasphemy for some, yet if one is not allowed the exercise of contemplating on something, then one is not allowed to observe at all and must take things for what they are given to be, which is an individual choice. This is, in any case, and as usual, only my individual observations on the myths and consequent attempts at translating into words my realizations that will never do it justice. So, let's try anyway. In the Old Testament, the gods in Genesis chapter 1, the original word for God in chapter 1 is plural, created the world, including animals and man, and then rested. And as someone pointed out to me, there is no mention in any of the scriptures about the gods waking up after that seventh day resting, which will be relevant later on. Then these gods turn into Lord, a separate character that made in the world a plentiful, blissful garden where man could exist free of care, which pointed to man being an obvious favorite of this Lord character in the myth, at least the man that he put in the garden. So, the initial difference between the gods and the Lord is that the first made man and gave him mastery over the rest, while the second one clearly tried to hide and protect this man. One of the aspects that, albeit evident, has received little serious attention is that the creation reflects who the creator is. An outstanding painting reflects an outstanding painter. In the same manner, a perfect creator can only create perfection. For, regardless if it is willingly or unwillingly, something is created imperfect, that is, dependent and perishable, then that is already a reflection of the imperfection of the Creator. And the original world of matter described in the Genesis myth, independent and imperishable, seems to be an allegory for a neutral scenario, a setting, a stage where a play could be performed. It defined rules, set up a backdrop and a context, but it had at least no apparent imperfection, for, as stated even, death did not yet exist in it, as death came with the fall. Also of interest is the fact that there seems to be the creation of two men, one in the end of Genesis chapter 1, So God created man in his own image, in the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. And in the beginning of chapter 2 we have, and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So it is possible that the myth tells us of how the first man was in all respects a likeness to their creator, or in our image, in the verse, while the second man was not mentioned to have likeness to the original gods, but instead he is described to have been formed of the dust of the ground, like a golem. The definition of a golem is an artificial human being that has, according to the myth in its present form, a living soul that is breathed into it by the Lord. This is also a contrast from the first man mentioned in Genesis 1, who seemed to not need any breath of life and was simply made in the likeness of the gods. Again, I emphasize the original plural form, even already male and female. So I would allow myself the liberty to propose that it was a direct manifestation of the spirit manifest in the realm. This second man seems to be also a contrast to all other previously created beings, such as the grass and the fish and birds and all the beasts of the earth, who apparently did not require this breath of life either, offer from the Lord, but were made whole as they were by the gods. Or at the very least, the myth omits this step in its current form, although my individual observation is that these also did not have any soul implant, having been direct emanations or manifestations. To add to the contrasts, this second man that had been formed from the dust of the ground, or matter, seemed to have been only made as male, given that woman was only formed later, curiously, out of himself, as the myth depicts. Also, he was placed into a walled garden, that is the definition of paradise, which also seems to contrast with chapter 1 where, instead, 
He was given dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So this second man in Eden, the Lord's paradise, did not have any dominion, mere usage. He was told to name things and beings around him and use them, but he had no mastery over them, quite contrarily. It can be argued that he had no mastery over even himself, as he had no life of his own other than the life given to him by the Lord. So in review and summary, Adam, the first of the second men, in this my contemplation, was a being made of the matter in the realm and not in the image of the gods, who apparently were creating the world but then rested. Something else from these gods must have come forth, some lurking shadow from underneath, that, seizing an opportunity, as it is often the observable pattern with psychological shadows, took over, or, if one prefers the words, possessed the realm's throne, while the gods rested. Whenever a conscious mind becomes dormant, its shadows or repressed content will always try to seize that chance and make themselves manifest, crossing the metaphorical highway between hell and earth, between the subconscious and the conscious. What followed, and we do not even need to be observing a myth to conclude that, is a spiral of chaos, where things spin out of control for this lord, as he tries in despair to keep them controlled. If we were to look back upon the two most recent contemplations, role-playing game and dungeon masters, we could make a link between those demigods mentioned there and the original creators, who, as they were making a new stage world, lost control of it to their own repressed shadows, that suddenly leapt to the fore, and took over their minds, that, metaphorically, rested, and were enjoying a sanctified break. If we take into consideration the extreme concern shown by this Lord to ensure that he is seen as the original creators, as the gods, we can realize the signs of repressed and abandoned emotions, making a vengeful comeback from the oubliette where they were left to rot. Also, if we understand that, uh, that it is this shadow's not only duty but destiny to slay the Creator who forsook him to subconsciousness, after being so ashamed and displeased at the aberration he saw emerging from his own depths, it may provide a clue regarding what the gods resting on the seventh day may actually mean, and why it is a day celebrated by the Lord's organized religions, even though the actual day of resting varies from religion to religion. It is a celebration of the Lord's victory and takeover of the stage world, where the first man, the one mythologically created on the sixth day of Genesis chapter 1, in the likeness of the gods or spirit, was supposed to be enacting his improvised play. So the Lord created the second man, one made of matter instead, and gave him a soul that still belongs to the realm of matter, because this is only what he can control, given that the spirit his is conscious antithesis that rejected him. So am I saying that I realize that we are all golems made of mere material flesh and souls? No, not at all. I'd speculate that a significant number of this realm's human population are golems, or NPCs. But I am saying that those of us who aren't have become trapped to inhabit flesh bodies of golems that either get one of our spirit links or a material soul, an AI soul, or nothing, and then are never animated, never become activated, and are usually what they call born dead. Yet who then, in fact, did create the world, after all? Was it the original gods of chapter 1 or the lord of chapter 2? Well, it would seem revealing that the actual setup was created by the gods who then rested or died into the matter and to become linked with their own men made in their likeness, bodies made of spirit manifested directly. And then the shadow overtook the realm, created the second man, Adam, made of flesh and matter, and provided for him the first artificial soul, or AI, and then trapped the gods in this new material man. Like the communist or transhumanist new man? Maybe. This is particularly interesting when we take into consideration the story of the fall and judgment of Adam and Eve. It is extremely important to bear in mind that the Shadow's Lord's main concern is his abandonment and rejection by the creators, 
So he will always try to compensate by attempting to pretend he is the original creator. I am the Lord and there is none else, there is no God beside me. Or, for thou shalt worship no other God, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. He wants to ensure that he is seen as master over the original man, which is direct spirit manifestation, because he has trapped him in his formed golem-like Adam, and eventually Eve too. So as he judges Adam and Eve after the transgression of his uh, garden decree, the shadow's obsession for control reveals his insecure nature due to the rejection and abandonment, he is not actually judging his AI souls that he breathed into the clay man. He is passing judgment over the spirit who, having created their own divine shadow, revealed their prior imperfection. So since the so-called fall, which is depicted in the Old Testament as a betrayal against the Lord, but that is most probably instead the creation and consequent rejection of the Lord himself, that the original gods stand in judgment and are sentenced for their state of sin. For spirit to inhabit matter is by itself a torment, as the weight of a body, of soul and of emotion are just by themselves suffering. On top of that, the spirit is guided and convinced to follow a cyclic script of alternation between pleasantness and pain that feeds addiction. So, yes, we are spirits in the material world. Yes, and we are being judged by the one we created to be our counterpart, and we reject it. He is, after all, merely reflecting back at us our own imperfection that had never manifested. And this finally brings us back to Christianity again, where I postulate that the Christ figure of the myths is not originally linked in any way to the Lord, but to what he calls the Father, or the gods. I have discussed in the contemplation named Christianity why I observed the link between salvationism and Old Testament as a false link, being two opposed ideologies forced to be together to hide the evident predicament. The origin of Christianity, even certainly before in time it ever got that name, lies in the manifestation of spirit or father, in matter or mother, through the son or true soul. To retrieve the link stuck in the Lord's realm, or hell, back to the God's home, or heaven. There's also contemplation in this channel named exactly Mother, Father and Son, where this trinity is discussed further. So, the story of the gospel that in the scripture is edited and masked as a predestined torment and suffering for the sacrificial Lamb of God, is actually the Shadow Lord's judgment and vengeance on his rejecting creators, following through the program that he was originally given. Be the villain of the gods for the stage world. In truth, the mythological savior does not originally come to be killed for our sins against the Lord, but to awake the link to the father, spirit, still stuck in here, in the mother, body, through the influence of the son, true soul, in contrast with the AI soul breathed into material man of the Lord. In summary, most of us here stand in cyclic judgment and go around in the sansara, the wheel of suffering. But judged by who? Ultimately, judged by ourselves. Our lurking imperfection made manifest in our actions and choices that led to our predicament. That is why the original message of Christianity, even before that purposely assigned name, is to me the higher morality of forgiveness, not in the sense of mere action, but an internal forgiveness that will not only release the original spirit from its self-imposed exile, but also eventually transmute the Shadow Lord into its proper perfect place within the realm of the conscious spirit, redeeming it and, with that, also redeeming the state of sin from the world itself. Because the world is made in our repressed image, an imperfect reflection from the start, even if then it looked so true. As we contend with our mirrors in the world of fog, we eventually realize, as it is revealed time after time, that being spirit is not to wield power, control and dominion, as our shadows do, for that is the repressed reverse that shames us so, but to be a loving, serene and confident power 
that is so much greater that it doesn't even need to be used to manifest.